that with the Career Development Council. And uh, we have partnered with the Shimon County Chamber of Commerce to put this event together. And Candace West is going to give us an introduction this morning. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> Welcome everyone to today's live MFG Day virtual session brought to you by the Career Development Council and the Shimon County Chamber of Commerce. Today's session will be presented by Cameron Manufacturing and Design and Hard and Jink. Many thanks to our presenters, Guy Loomis and Rich Hazen of <coughs> Cameron and Janine Cleary and Scott Monoski of Hardinge for being with us today and all the participants who have joined in. Please note this webinar is being recorded to share what we learn with the business and education community. There will be time for questions after each presentation. Students and student screens and audio will not be available, so please use the Q&A to submit any questions during the presentation. And just a reminder to the panelists to please keep your audio on mute when someone else is speaking to minimize background noise. With that said, I'll turn things over to Janine and Scott. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Janine Cleary. I'm the Human Resource Director at Hardinge. And with me today is Scott Malnowski, our Assembly Supervisor. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> and we also have, um, today we're featuring in our video our mechanical and electrical assembly process of how we manufacture our machines. And then we're gonna show you a demonstration um, from our customer side. Uh, Cameron Manufacturing has uh, owns one of our hardened machines. And so they'll show you what they do with it in the field. Okay, but with us, we have uh, Matt Swan, he's our electrical assembler Hi. and Keith Horn, Hello. our mechanical assembler. Um, so I wanna start by showing you a video of um, just an introduction to our company. And that hopefully is um, going to be right here. And so I'm gonna make this bigger.
Okay, so now, um, can you guys hear me again? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so that was just a little bit of an overview of the company. And um, I, right now I wanna turn it over to um, first Keith. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't think I lose video when I do this, so um, it'll come back to us. So we won't worry about that. But um, Keith can tell us a little bit about uh, his career in um, mechanical assembly. Hi, my name's Keith. I uh, started here back in 2015. Um, didn't have any prior experience, so to speak, with machine tools or machine tooling or building of. Um, went to Alfred State for automotive technology, graduated with a two-year degree, associate's degree, and was fortunate enough to be hired here at Hardinch. Um, pretty much everything I've learned here is uh, standard mechanical knowledge, and it's been a lot of on-the-job training, um, learning how to deal with super precision alignments and reading different uh, gauging and, and uh, measuring devices. And... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> did, did you work anywhere before you came to Hardinger or was this the for your first uh, job out of school? I worked in a couple different automotive shops. Um, actually, I was hired at Hardinger originally in 1995, got laid off in 2001, okay. and uh, drove tractor trailer for 15 years, 14 oh, years, okay. and then decided that wasn't for me anymore and came back to Hardinger. was fortunate enough to get back in and I've come a long way since I've been back. Yeah, I'll say. Okay, um, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about your career? I'm Matt Swan. I uh, went to Alfred State for construction maintenance electrician in 2008, uh, 2010. Got my associates. Uh, started off as a Time Warner tech from uh, college. Worked there for about a year and a half. Then I went to Ward Manufacturing and bid up to their HMAC plant for, and I was there for four years as an electrician. Then I went on to Douglas Electric and I was a construction uh, electrician contractor for two years. And I started here in 2017 of August, been here since. And then learning a lot from the electrical side from all my previous experience and learn more today with uh, controls and programming for the machines. Okay. Okay, good, thank you. So now I wanna show a video of the work that uh, Matt and Keith do uh, to build one of our machines. And so we have narration that's um, kind of explaining the process of the whole machine assembly. Um, and then we'll, we'll answer some questions and. Um, that some of the audience might have. So I'm still sharing my screen, right? Since I can't see any video. Yes, you are. Good. All right, so now we'll just show this video. <clears throat> Here at Hardinge Incorporated, one of our products is a T-Series Super Precision Lathe. It takes a range of talent and skill sets to manufacture one of these machines. You can categorize the main of this video is the start of the main machine assembly. Prior to this, Sub-assemblies are built and ready for this step. It takes approximately 250 hours to build one of these machines from start to finish. This process you're seeing now takes around 24 hours. To start, we inspect the base for quality, which is mainly alignments on moving parts. We then start adding the main components mechanically. Main spindle and motor, sub-spindle and motor, turret which may have a live tool for additional machining. All these are aligned to each other with specifications in the ten thousandths of an inch, which is 0 .0001. Once they are installed, we install some of the interior sheet metal to cover the moving parts of the machine once it is assembled. This will keep coolant and machining chips contained in the machine as well as keeping critical mechanical components protected. Once the base is assembled, it is moved to another area where the rest of the assembly will take place. It will be paired up with a power case and a canopy that you can see being installed. 
This is also a mechanical type skill set involved to put these three pieces of the machine together. After that comes the electrical part of the assembly. All the wiring from the power case is ran to the base and canopy. This will take up to four days or 32 hours. Once all the wires, air, and hydraulic lines are run, it will be ready to have the power turned on to it. This is where the technical employee will come in and troubleshoot any alarms that it may have at power up. They then start setting the machine up by loading software and parameters, setting home positions, and balancing the spindles. The next step is to run 12 hours uninterrupted or without faults, so it will then go into the inspection phase. Here is where the last step is to double check the accuracy of the machine by performing a test cut that has to be within 0 0.000015 inches for roundness. The technician will then use a laser to make sure the machine is dialed in when it comes to accuracy. It checks repeatability and straightness on all axes at full range of travel. After that, we install the remaining sheet metal and components to test the coolant system. This is a combination of mechanical and technical skills. The final steps are to perform another inspection on the machine and prepare it for shipment. Okay, so I think um, I need to move this to be able to stop sharing my screen. Um, I can stop your screen share if you want. Oh, that'd be awesome because it's not working for me to, there's like something in my way. Okay, perfect. <coughs> so, um, so that's a little bit about the machine assembly process. Um, do you, is there any questions yet? From um, the audience? I don't see any questions in there. And just a note okay. to our students, um, if you don't think of any questions right now, um, Cameron is gonna talk next, uh, so you do have time to think about it and we will take more questions at the end. Uh, is there okay. anything? Sorry. Yeah, you... I mean, so so what I can do now is just uh, elaborate a little bit more on our customers and um, you know the, the, the company as a whole. Uh, what you saw in the video is that we are a, um, you know, a global company. We have facilities all around the world. Uh, we produce these types of machines in um, Nantou, Taiwan, uh, Zhejiang, China, and then uh, here in, um, in Switzerland, we also manufacture grinding machines and we have a facility in Elgin, Illinois that does grinding machines as well. And we have facilities that produce specialty work holding um, in Traverse City, Michigan, and then in Germany, and India, and France, uh, and China, too. So, so we do everything, um, customized solutions for machine tool, which encompasses turning, milling, grinding, uh, and then the work holding, which grip the metal while it's being worked on in our machines, okay? So basically, anything that you think about that's made out of metal, um, is probably either machined on a, on a lathe, like ones we produce here at Hardinge, or um, it's, uh, we use the collets uh, to hold the metal while it's being worked on in a machine. And one example I can give you is, um, you think of a bottle cap, right? So if you bought, um, you know, the old style Coca-Cola with the pop top, um, that, so to make that design, um, of the bottle cap, that's we would use a crimping collet to actually get that um, to put to be placed onto the bottle, right? So that's just one everyday example. Um, your cell phone, the cases are usually made out of metal, and those are um, produced using milling machines, right, to route it out and, and to create the shape that you'd find in your everyday household items. Um, at our facility in Elmira, we employ 350 employees over three shifts. And um, in the U.S. in total, we have about 450 employees altogether. And then globally, we have about um, 1,500 employees in each of the regions of the world, right? So we would classify our regions as the uh, Americas, Europe, and Asia. So that's just a little bit about Hardinge. Um, so Guy, do you want me to pass the mic on to you at this point? Yes. 
All right, so um, I don't. I think Rich is still having some uh, technical difficulties, so I'll just start without him. I will start by just showing a, a brief uh, introduction video to Cameron, and hopefully I have all the settings right so you can hear it. So let's see. I need to... Where is screen share? On the bottom. Oh, yeah, it's oh. on the bottom on your toolbar. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we don't have audio on your video. What do I need to do? Deb, chime in because I don't know where you're talking about. So what you want to do is when you're about to do the screen share, you have to click on the bottom left of the video or below the video, the, um, the share sound. All right, all right, so I have the the screen share. Mm -hmm. And you first click that and it shows the what you're gonna share. There's There should be something along the bottom, lower left-hand oh, side of your screen. Okay. Yeah, for sound. Okay. Let's try that again, sorry. Since 1983, Cameron Manufacturing and Design has met the necessary fabrication needs for the people and businesses of Elmira and across the globe. Developing great people means achieving great results and securing a great future. As a leading producer of metal fabrication, custom machinery and installation services, flawless workmanship and unmatched customer service remain paramount at our company's core. At Cameron Manufacturing, we primarily work with large equipment manufacturers, rail and transit companies, food and dairy industries, and construction companies, to name a few. Manufacturing the future for decades. Cameron Manufacturing and Design, your fabricator of choice. Since then. Okay. okay, everybody's able to hear that? Yes. Okay, so uh, as the video says, we are a, a custom fabrication shop. And what that means is we do not have any product line of our own. So we do contract work for, uh, you know, equipment manufacturers. We do a lot of rail car work. Um, we have some companies that uh, we produce equipment that makes uh, wood pellet mills, um, uh, dog food, things of that nature. We also do some work with uh, companies that manufacture glass. A lot of our product ends up overseas. So it, it's very important that we build parts to the print um, cause you know, if you, if you're putting something on a boat and then two months later, it shows up somewhere, it's important that it all goes together. Um, I don't see where Rich has joined us yet. I will start the, uh, Hardinge video. We'll watch that quick. Uh, I was hoping Rich would be on here and he could kind of talk about what the, uh, what the machine's doing. Um, one of the things I'll say that kind of, um, is a little bit different for our business. I, I actually worked almost 15 years at Hardinge. I started there as a welder. I ran press brakes, um, ran, you know, the was involved primarily with the sheet metal uh, business unit at the time. So I'm very familiar with the equipment, uh, the machine that we have from Hardinge. It's a Q42 lathe. It, from an accuracy standpoint, it, it far exceeds the other brands that we have. It's a very good machine. Um, I'm going to show a quick video that we just did of it uh, making just a sample part. And let's see. So. Here, 
share screen video. Okay. okay. Everybody can see that? Yes. Guy, it looks like Rich is on. Oh, he's on? Got sound, Rich? Doesn't sound like it. I can see him trying to talk, and he's not uh, not able to be heard yet. I don't know if he's, he might be on his way over here. Apologize for that. This is uh, new to us doing this type of thing, or at least new to me and Rich. It's new to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just prevents us from doing a live demonstration, but uh, so that's why we did the pre-recorded videos, but there's still technical difficulties, right? Yep. yep. Absolutely. So while we're waiting for Rich, um, <clears throat> some of the things that is a little bit different with a with the type of work we do is we might build you know one part and never see it again, or if it, if you're dealing typically with rail car, we could be working on the same sets of parts for for over a year straight, um, depending on what the contract is. So a lot of our machinists, um, you know program their own equipment we, we do not for the most part have somebody that writes all their programs for them so the skill sets of and, and i'll see how we're, we're talking about the machine shop um you know the, the the guys that run the equipment really have to know what they're doing what they're looking at they have to be able to interpret uh, uh obviously a blueprint um one of the downsides is you know not everybody's prints are are good so, and you know, if, if we, if our engineering department made all of the prints, we would have a, a uh, you system. Off that. All right. um, and the Hopefully. fact that we deal with customers, um, different customers, some are good and, and some leave a little bit to be desired. So that, that is one of the challenges as a, a contract manual that we have to deal with. Um, Rich, are you set? I can hear you. Can, I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? You, you are talking. You, you so. are talking. Oh. Okay. Oh. I have no screen right now, so I, uh, here we go. Something's right. coming up. Can you see the video, Rich? I can. All right. So this is Rich Hazen. Uh, he's one of the machinists in our machine shop. Rich runs the, the hinge lathe and others. Um, Rich, do you want to just talk a little bit about your background, how you got to be a machinist? Sure. Uh, so... I've been a machinist in the area for over 20 years and I've been working at Cameron here and uh, I just have a passion for machining, uh, especially on a Harding machine, uh, super precision. And this video is just kind of a test piece that we put together for uh, to get some people asking some questions. Rich, just want to tell them quick a little bit just about, you know, what are some of the things you, you need to, to know to become, a will say, a successful machinist, some of your just background, how you got interested? Yeah, uh, math, lots of math. Um, you know, starting out, it, it, it just started out as a job and then I, it turned into a passion. Um, Uh, you know what to say about uh, you know someone's individual passion, but mine is just to 
creativity that comes with it. Uh, designing a different part, implementing that into the process of machining it. That's, I guess that's the road I took. Okay, all right, I'll start the video. for the cross hole. We're drilling a cross hole here now. Grab the part, sub spindle, did you do any backward? And for the record, I'm sure that the guys that Hardinge picked up on this, you, you saw a little bit of uh, on the on the head or the spindle, a little bit of uh, carnage. Uh, it, number one, that wasn't done by Rich. And number two, Hardinge doesn't shift. <laughs> so that's what happens when you make an error when when uh, tooling and things run into other parts, which it does happen. This particular machine, I believe, was manufactured in like 2003. Does that sound right, Rich? I think so. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, this this is a little bit older machine, but a very good machine. And and like I said, in, in my opinion, and I'm sure Rich is by far the most accurate lathe that we have on site. Oh, absolutely. Feel like the first day it was new. Um, so, like I said, other things that kind of just set us apart from a. Um, an OEM shop is the fact that we never know what we're going to be working on. And we have a lot of, you know, customers like to wait to the last minute. They don't give you much lead time. So a lot of times there, there's a lot of, there's a sense of urgency that, that you need to have. And you also need, you know, not get frustrated by, by change when it comes to, you know, you might go into work thinking, you know, what you're going to do all day and so an emergency might happen or, or something could break down and, and that plan is totally out the window. So that, that happens. We try to keep that stuff to a minimum, but in, in today's uh, world, especially with the current situation, there's all sorts of surprises that go on as far as what your day is gonna, gonna entail. Um, anybody have any, any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions typed in there yet. Uh, just a little shout out to our students. You can type into the Q&A. Um, unfortunately, we don't have audio for you, um, but while we're waiting, uh, you're welcome to add anything. And um, I'd just like to ask Rich, um, so as a machinist, what do you look for for an entry level machinist? Is there any kind of certification required? Um, well, so when I, when I first started out, um, it was operating, just strictly operating, um, and you learn the process 
Uh, I did not go to school for machining. Um, it, that's just the path I kind of took. And I started out operating and learning from coworkers and just taking my own self-initiative to try things. And fortunately, I worked for a company that allowed us to do that and, and just progress from there. And now I'm working for uh, a company that, you know, is open to, you know, new ideas and new ways of doing things. And, and I've kind of uh, you know, even took my, uh, my career a little further in that direction of just constantly improving my process. So it starts out, you could be starting out just your desire to learn and to want a machine will grow in time. And, uh, but starting out was, uh, you know, the, the hardest part, the soul search, and see if this is really what you wanted to do. And it took about, I'd say, a year before I really decided that I wanted to do this. And when that decision came is when a lot of opportunity opened up for me. Okay. We do have uh, one question coming in right now. Uh, how many welders do you employ at this time, and are you looking to hire welders? Uh, so right now, um, trying to think, at one point we were up to around 70 welders. Um, our ideal, I'll say, headcount for the total company is probably right around 200. That That's a, a fairly staffing level that sales can, you know, continue to bring in work. Um, if I, right now we're probably around 40 welders. We are still hiring welders. Um, and, and I would say people in the, in the process or sheet metal area and, and even good machinists. If, you know, um, we're still actively hiring, we have to build our headcount about, uh, back up. Overall, we're about 30 people shy on our direct labor of where we want to be for 2021. And what are you looking for in a new welder as an employee, skills, et cetera? So we, you know, we, we look at, first thing I look at is people with initiative, people are gonna show up every day. People that can pass a drug test. Um, sounds pretty basic, but sometimes that's a challenge. As far as skill sets, um, you know, our workforce, if I had to guess is probably, you know, our average age now is probably upper thirties to mid forties. Um, and, and we need to bring in the younger guys to, you know, continue this, this business into the future. So if we have some, you know, if you have somebody that has, you know, phenomenal skills, that's great. Um, for the most part, those people are probably already working somewhere and I'm sure Harding sees the same thing. Um, if we have people that come in here, can take direction, want to learn, show some initiative. I mean, we've had, we have a lot of people here that started out as a shop hand. And what that means is somebody that probably went around sweeping floors, taking out the garbage, taking out the scrap, and they showed potential, they expressed some interest. And the, some of these guys now are, are excellent machinists, excellent welders, um, you know, press break operators, et cetera. So it, it's really just, it, we, we look for people that want to learn. Okay. Uh, Janine, could you also talk about uh, entry level opportunities at Hardinge and what kind of requirements you're looking for? Okay. Um, so at Hardinge, <clears throat> for entry level, um, just like Guy said, a lot of times that we're looking for somebody that um, has basic skills, right? They demonstrated their ability to hold down a job. Uh, they come to work every day, they have good attendance, and um, they meet those requirements of a uh, basic mechanical and at least eighth grade math level. We actually do administer a test, um, the test of adult basic education, um, so that someone can demonstrate their ability to um, convert fractions to decimals and back again, um, understand how to read and interpret blueprints and schematics. Um, so for mechanical and electrical assembly, uh, sometimes we're hoping that they have um, a technical degree, right? Associates, um, possibly either in um, like automotive or um, some electrical certifications uh, for the mechanical electrical assembly. We also employ machinists that um, work in the work holding side. 
So the little bit of difference between what um, a machinist might do at Cameron, um, they might take one part and produce it, you know, do the turning, the milling and the grinding operations on that piece, right? That's more of a custom job shop. And for us, when we're manufacturing collets, our machinists might only run a lathe or only run a mill um, or only do grinding. So they are a little bit more specialized in their, um, their process area and they're producing multiple parts of the same, you know, that same step in the process. Does that make sense? I yeah, think so. one, one thing I'll add is when we interview, um, so like for a welder, for example, they come in, we have a weld inspector on site, we give them a weld test. We also give them um, a written test that, that, as Janine said, similar, you know, convert fractions, uh, has some basic math, has some blueprint questions, and it kind of gives us a, a feel for what people know or don't know. And so that, you know, number one, we can, you know, do we have an opportunity for them? And then also helps us establish what we feel a, a fair rate of, of pay will be. Um, on the machine shop side, we bring them right over. You know, obviously the, 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 the supervisor uh, and or group leader will, you know, kind of get a feel for what their knowledge is. And then we'll, we pull out a print and we, you know, we'll have, ask them some very specific questions. We'll ask them questions about, um, you know, writing um, the codes involved with programming the machines to, to get a feel for what we, we think they know. Usually that's pretty successful. Uh, every now and then we'll have somebody that, you know, uh, know, knows knows the book side of it, but when it comes to actually doing the work, you know, struggles. And we, we've, as we've, um, in the past, we got zinged by that a few times and we've kind of modified our, I'll say our um, interview to try to take that, that, that out of it so that that doesn't happen. Uh, so I have a question here asking, what is your typical pay rate? So that would depend on, on skill set. I mean, right now, it, it, like a shop hand um, probably comes in the door 12, 13 bucks an hour. Um, and then a high end guy would be in the upper 20s. And then we do have an incentive program that's a quarterly program and it's based on bottom line financials. So if the company does well, it pays out a, a bonus system. And that's dependent upon volume and the type of work that goes through here. And at Hardinge, the, um, the entry level pay rate might be uh, more in the $14 range. Because again, we're looking for um, folks to have passed those, those testing requirements. And um, then they'll go and learn some basic machining fundamentals, um, understand um, the, how to measure properly using micrometers um, and understand the, the breakdown of um, an inch down to its fractional form um, and, uh, and then perform entry level jobs on the shop floor. Uh, someone in mechanical assembly, I would say, starting rate of pay, uh, again, with an associate's degree and, um, or, or uh, at least five years of mechanical experience, uh, might start in the $18 range, and then electrical might be even a little bit higher than that. And then the same with uh, what Guy said, for program or machinists, uh, they're earning, and that's someone who finishes an associate's degree, right? There's, you know, Corning Community College, Alfred State, Penn College, they offer technical degrees in machine tool technology, and they're learning how to program and operate um, the lathes and milling machines, and those people would command in the $20 range starting. Okay, so someone asked, is there a way to become a coder for one of the machines, which I think you touched upon a little bit, but is it, so is that a degree? So, um, Become, oh, go ahead, to be a coder. Go ahead, Janine. Oh, okay. So what I was going to say was um, in the degree programs at the local um, college, community colleges, they do have um, the programming is something that they're, they're taught in year two. And then um, our local BOCES Bush campus actually has an adult ed um, program that's a six month program that uh, can teach you the fundamentals of machining too, if you decided not to 
um, pursue it uh, as, a, as a degree. And then um, there are folks that do learn on the job, but um, you know, going to school and learning that way is also another way to advance yourself, right? So if we could hire someone entry level, we have educational reimbursement. So we would encourage employees to then go back and look into schooling and, um, and then they could be reimbursed for taking the classes and then they'd have the ability to kind of leapfrog past their peers uh, that were hired around the same time as them um, to become a programmer machinist. Yeah, so we also work with uh, BOCES, with, with Corning Community. Um, you know, for us, like Rich, for example, who Rich, you know, went to work and, and, and learned at the shop, uh, we don't really, we, we don't hire just people with degrees. We'll look at anybody that has potential. Um, I, and I've seen, I've seen it both ways. I've seen people with degrees that are, that are very good and, and then some that are not so good. And I've seen people that just went to work and, and learned on the, on the job training and pretty good. And then again, some that are not so very good. So um, I, I would say we really don't even have a, a preference. Um, and we do also do some tuition reimbursement, although it's been a while since I can think that anybody has, has really oh taken God. that upon them. Oh um, uh, last year you said that. Corning Community College for a master cam course. Uh, that was all paid for by Cameron. Yeah, I, I guess what I was thinking, Rich, where somebody like said, hey, I want to learn to do blank and started taking classes. Yeah. But yes, to Rich's point, we'll do some stuff with master cam on occasion, or if, if we need to get people in here for training um, on our sheet metal side of the business, we have sent employees up to Chicago. Um, the majority of our equipment is Amada and have, have, you know, have sent them out there for training. So we, we definitely don't have a, a problem with, with doing, uh, you know, I'll say specific topics like that um, as, as needed. Um, so another student asked, what colleges do you usually take people from for jobs? You mentioned Corning Community. Are there any others that you typically see? Penn College in Williamsport. But I don't know about you guys, Janine, for us, the, the, I'll say the issue with Penn College is the majority of those students, at least the ones that, that we talk to, are usually from PA or south of PA. And we've had very limited success with anybody from that either A, wants to move up to um, this area or that is from this area that goes there and starts. I, I wanna say since I've been here, and that's been since 2008, we might've had maybe two people out of Penn Tech that have that we've hired. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you too though that the I think the students out of the programs at Penn College are very are in very high demand. So they're getting a, an excellent education if they choose to go down there. But I agree with you. We do have one employee that we hired um, well, I guess, yeah, one employee um, in the last two years and then another out of the Alfred State program too, so. Yeah, um, Al Alfred State's another one, yeah. And as to, to what follow up on what Janine said, I, I went to Penn Tech for Associates in Welding and that place, you know, that was back in the early 90s. That is a very good school, very good technical school. They have a lot of resources. They, they just really expanded their weld shop over the last several years. Uh, but like, like I said, unfortunately, um, we had attracting students from there to come up to this area. I have, I'm not seeing any more questions right now. Is there anything else um, either would, either of you would like to add before we close up? I, I would just go back to something Rich said about kind of, you know, passion for what you do. Um, for me, when I got out of high school, really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I, I was I worked for about a, a year or so and quickly realized that washing cars wasn't probably going to be the, the best career path. And I got I actually got interested in welding through um, just racing a, a, a car at a local dirt track. And that kind of really ignited what I wanted to do. Uh, I can remember very clearly at the time going to, to Penn College and, and any chance I could get in the welding lab, I was in there for rod, you know, big welding, whatever it was. When I started at Hardinge, 
I don't know if I called it more than three months. They had an opportunity on the press breaks, which at the time nobody wanted to run because it's very tedious, borderline pain in the ass. Um, and I, I just, I, it is, it is. Um, but I love doing it. I, I love the, just the mechanics of it. And from there, apparently I showed enough initiative. We had an opportunity to start doing programming, which I got involved with one of the engineers there at the time. Uh, Janine, I don't know, Glenn Greenall, if, if you guys still, if you know Glenn, but Glenn showed me like the basics of AutoCAD. Um, okay. And I, I just kind of went from there. Um, so one of our educators wants to know, do you think that new employees understand that you invest time and money in them to employ them? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll look to my uh, my team here. Do you think uh, employees that come into an organization understand that? Yeah. Yeah, I think the majority of them do. Okay. I think there's some of them that are just here for a paycheck. But. <laughs> Yeah. Which is probably how we all started at one time. Yeah. Not necessarily here, but wherever. I mean, your first job might not be your career choice. Right. Yeah. yeah and we've had some very good success where we do summer internships, and that gives us an opportunity to kind of, again, get a feel for someone's work ethic, their attitude. And We've hired over the years a number of, of people that started here again as a summer intern, and, and they've become very skilled, you know, employees. So a student wants to know if you consider BOCES as a type of degree or specifically college only. So I guess does the BOCES education weigh the same as the as maybe an associates or? For me, again, I go by what what a person, um, you know, the person themselves. What is their, uh, you know, desire to learn? Um, if if I had someone in front of me that had a, a went to BOCES um, and had a, a great attitude, was enthusiastic enthusiastic compared to a, someone with a four year degree from a from you know Go Penn Penn College that had a, a terrible attitude, and and I would go with the BOCES in a heartbeat. So the, the, the degree doesn't, you know, just because you go whatever, two, four years, doesn't mean you're going to be successful. It's all on the person and what drives them. Yes, I agree. We hear that a lot from employers. And and for us at Hardinge, um, you know, just like Guy is a former Hardinge employee, the instructor at Bosey's Bush Campus is a former Hardinge employee. So we have a great relationship with Dave Decker and, um, and we really feel like they – they're um, covering a great foundational knowledge to help students um, transition even into the machine tool program at Corning Community College. Um, so yes, the, the BOCES program is highly regarded. And uh, in fact, at the Cooper's Plains campus, they have um, like a shop program for the high school students that would educate them on the welding and the machining, right? Just a lot of metal working in general. Um, but unfortunately at Bush campus, there's not, um, you know, anything at the high school level. It's only the adult ed that they offer the machining class. And do you, either of you offer um, summer internships? And if so, how do students find out or apply for that? Yes, we do. Um, we should do, I, I don't know if we do postings online now. I'd have to verify it with HR, but if someone was interested, call over here, ask for our HR department, and um, that, that would be a, a means to apply. Uh, yeah, same thing here. I think for our um, internships that usually we do require our employees to be at least 18 years of age, so we don't have a lot to offer, unfortunately, while you're in high school, um, but as you're getting close to graduation and thinking about your future, um, we have those opportunities to employ people and give them exposure. In fact, we, uh, we interviewed and hired one student out of the, um, 
uh, the Cooper's Plains program when he graduated and he was 18. He came and worked for us for the summer. And then we employed him part time while he was attending Corning Community College. So it ends up being a great relationship um, when there's those that interest in machining. But unfortunately, the other half of that program being welding, uh, we don't employ welders at Hardinge. So um, so the other students of the program really weren't um, attractive to us at the time. Yeah, so we typically will take six, maybe eight interns. Um, we have had some in here younger than 17. If they are, they cannot run equipment or, you know, fork truck, things of that nature. So it, it's, there, there's been some that we've hired just for painting, doing kind of like shop maintenance, et cetera. So that, that's kind of how we go about it. Okay, I think we uh, are nearing our hour here and we do need to wrap things up. So I'll give you one last second if there's anything else you wanted to add. Um, if not, uh, I will thank the chamber once again. Candace, thank you for all the help and coordination. And also a huge thank you to Guy and Janine. Um, for putting together these presentations and educating our students and letting them know about some great opportunities in our area. So with that, I'll just uh, end the webinar and say thank you to everyone who attended. All right, thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey.